Welcome to Group 63's presentation on Pathways of a Red Blood Cell from the Heart and Back to the Heart. We hope this presentation gives you a good understanding of the anatomy a red blood cell faces along its systemic and pulmonary journey. The red blood cell first begins systemic circulation after flowing from left atrium to left ventricle and into the aortic arch superior to the heart. The cell enters elastic arteries before moving into muscular arteries and then arterioles. Gas and nutrient exchange then takes place inside the capillary beds. The deoxygenated blood drains into venules, then veins, before entering the superior or inferior vena cavae and ultimately into the right atrium of the heart. Pulmonary circulation begins when the cell moves from the right atrium to the right ventricle and is pumped into the pulmonary trunk, then to the pulmonary artery leading to the lungs. After the blood passes through smaller and smaller arteries, capillaries, and eventually alveolus, gases are exchanged and it then exits the lungs through larger and larger veins until the pulmonary vein is reached. The pulmonary vein then drains into the left atrium and our cycle recommences. One complete cycle of the systemic and pulmonary circuits takes about a minute, depending on which tissue the cell oxygenates. The main function of red blood cells is to transport oxygen to the body's cells and deliver carbon dioxide to the lungs. The protein inside the red blood cells is called hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. The unique shape of the red blood cell makes it easy for, to, for them to maneuver through tiny blood cells to deliver oxygen to the tissues and the organs. Another key use of the red blood cell is to help determine human blood type. To determine human blood type, your immune system looks for the presence or absence of antigens, which rest on top of the red blood cells. Your bone marrow inside your bone is where the red blood cells are produced. In both systemic and pulmonary circulation, blood vessels are the essential pipelines through which red blood cells transport oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, hormones, and waste products to and from body tissues. There are three main classes of arteries that move red blood cells around the body. First, elastic arteries, the largest type, are found close to the heart and help push blood into the muscular arteries, which are medium-sized distributing arteries that are less elastic. Issue. The last and smallest artery are the arterioles, which have fewer than six smooth muscle layers in their tunic media, still enough to control flow into the capillary beds. Capillaries are the functional unit of the cardiovascular system. They're just large enough to have erythrocytes flow through single file and have just a single layer of endothelium in their tunica interna, thin enough so that gases and nutrients can be exchanged. Continuous capillaries have endothelial cells connected by tight junctions, Fenustrated capillaries, which are porous, allow diffusion of interstitial fluid, and sinusoids, which have gaps or holes large enough for cells to flow in and out of structures like bone marrow or glands. The heart is the driving force of a red blood cell's path through the circulatory system and where our blood cell's journey begins. There are six major structures that are usher blood out of the heart. They are the ascending aorta, the coronary arteries and aortic arch, the common carotid arteries, subclavian arteries, the descending thoracic aorta, and the common iliac arteries. We have two questions for our viewers to consider today. First, if all veins, arteries, and capillaries were connected, what distance would they cover? Second, a typical human body contains 5.6 liters of blood with the heart pumping about 7,500 liters of blood a day. Many professional fighters, however, disrupt the cycle and flow by using the rear naked choke in an attempt to knock out their opponent. Why do you think the rear naked choke results in the loss of consciousness and which part of circulation is affected? The majority of blood supply to the head is by the common carotid arteries, which ascend into the external branch that supplies blood to external skull structures and the internal branch supplying blood to the internal skull structures. Blood flow returns through the facial, superficial, temporal, and maxillary veins, eventually draining into either the internal or external jugular veins that merge into the subclavian vein, and then the brachiocephalic vein, which directs into the superior vena cavae before returning to the heart. A unique feature of the cranial systemic circulation is the circle of Willis, best seen from an inferior transverse section. It is an essential union of the anterior and posterior communicating and cerebral arteries and the internal carotid arteries. This circle equalizes blood pressure in the brain and provides alternative channels of blood flow should our red blood cell get stuck along the way. The answers to our questions earlier are that if all arteries, veins, and capillaries were connected and laid out, they would cover over 100,000 kilometers. 
The answer to the second question is that the rear naked choke actually cuts off the blood flow of the carotid artery. And if used in a fight, the person, although they can still breathe, they're losing blood flow to their brain, ultimately resulting in the loss of consciousness. The main supply of blood to the upper limb is the subclavian artery, which becomes the axillary artery and then the brachial artery after passing the inferior border of the teres major muscle. The artery then divides into the radial and ulnar arteries supplying blood to the forearm. The arteries continue past the wrist then into the palm where a union or anastomosis is formed. Individual digital arteries then branch off the palmar arches to supply blood to each of the fingers. Drainage of the limb follows a consistent naming pattern with venae comitants or companion vessels pairing the palmar, radial and ulnar, the brachial and axillary arteries. When the left and right subclavian vein and jugular vein of the neck merge, they form the brachiocephalic veins, which together form the superior portion of the vena cavae. Our erythrocyte has now returned to the heart. Note the pulse points found throughout the body where arteries can be compressed against hard surfaces. This section of the slideshow will be focused on the blood flow through the thoracic and the abdominal walls. We will also be discussing blood flow through the thoracic organs, though we will only be focused on the lungs, esophagus, and the diaphragm. So the blood flow to the thoracic and abdominal walls begins with the internal thoracic artery. This artery branches off from the left and the right subclavian artery and then runs down the thoracic region along the spine. From there, there are many branches out, including the anterior intercostal arteries, which supply to the front portion of the six intercostal spaces. The muscular phrenic artery, which then further divides into the seventh, eighth, and ninth anterior intercostal arteries. The anterior thoracic artery then branches into the superior epigastric artery, which supplies to the superior abdominal wall, and likewise the inferior epigastric artery connects to the superior epigastric artery, supplies to the inferior abdominal wall. For each of the arteries which uh, supply to the thoracic and the abdominal walls, there's a vein used for drainage that drains into the brachiocephalic veins and then merges to become the superior vena cava. The diaphragm is then supplied by three sets of paired arteries, the superior phrenic arteries, which branch from the descending aorta, musculocophrenic and pericardiocophrenic arteries, which branch from the internal thoracic artery, and inferior phrenic arteries, which emerge from the descending abdominal aorta. And we have these little clip arts to kind of explain how the veins or how the arteries will travel through uh, the diaphragm and supply blood to the diaphragm. Three unpaired arteries emerge from the anterior wall of the descending abdominal aorta to supply the gastrointestinal tract. From superior to inferior, these arteries are the celiac trunk, which supplies the esophagus, stomach, part of the duodenum, the liver, part of the pancreas, the spleen, and the gallbladder. The superior mesenteric artery, which supplies blood to the midgut, lower duodenum, jejunum, ileum, large intestine, and two-thirds of the transverse colon and the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies the hindgut, the distal one-third of the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. Veins of the gastrointestinal tract all merge into some part of the hepatic portal system. The hepatic portal system is a network of veins that drains the GI tract and shunts the blood to the liver for absorption and processing of transported materials. The liver is unusual in that it has a double blood supply. Following nutrient absorption, the blood exits the liver through the hepatic veins that merge with the inferior vena cava. Moving on to the thoracic organs, as I had said at the beginning, we'll be focused on the lungs, esophagus, and diaphragm, but it's always good to remember the heart is considered a thoracic organ as it is in the thoracic cavity. And how the blood flows through the esophagus, it's supplied through the esophageal arteries, which branch from the anterior side of the descending aorta, the musculophrenic and pericardiocophrenic arteries, which branch from the internal thoracic artery, and then the inferior phrenic arteries emerge from the descending abdominal aorta. Three other paired arterial branches emerge from the sides of the descending abdominal aorta. They are the middle suprarenal artery, which supplies each adrenal gland, the renal artery supplying each kidney, the gonadal artery supplying each gonad, testes in males, ovaries in females, and these organs are drained by companion veins that all merge directly into the vena cava. The primary arterial supply to the pelvis and perineum is from the internal iliac artery. Branches include the superior and inferior gluteal arteries to supply the gluteal region, the orbiturator artery to supply the medial muscles of the thigh, the internal pudental artery to supply the anal canal and perineum, the middle rectal artery to supply the lower portion of the rectum, 
the uterine artery and vaginal artery in females to supply the uterus and vagina. The pelvis and perineum are drained by veins that merge with the internal, then common iliac veins, which subsequently drains into the inferior vena cava also. The external iliac artery originates from the groin artery, which descends from the bifurcated abdominal aorta. These become the femoral arteries, which are the main supply of blood to the lower limbs and the hip joint. The red blood cell might then travel further inferiorly to the knee via the popliteal artery, then continue to either the posterior or anterior tibial arteries. Medial and lateral arteries are on the anterior of the foot, with dorsalis pedis on top and digital arteries extending to supply the toes. Drainage occurs into either superficial or deep and similarly named companion veins. The great saphenous vein runs from medial ankle to medial limb all the way up to the femoral vein, as well as the small saphenous vein, which runs from lateral ankle up to the popliteal vein. The red blood cell will then follow the ipsilateral common iliac vein and eventually return to the heart through the inferior vena cavae. Another systemic circuit has been completed. Pulmonary circulation is responsible for transporting deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs and then returning the newly oxygenated blood to the left side of the heart. At the end of the systemic cycle, blood low in oxygen enters the right ventricle of the heart and is then sent into the pulmonary trunk, which divides into the left pulmonary artery and a right pulmonary artery that go to the respective lungs. In the lungs, the pulmonary arteries divide into smaller arteries and eventually arterioles. These arterioles branch into pulmonary capillaries where the gas exchange occurs. The alveoli in the lungs remove carbon dioxide and replace it with oxygen. The pulmonary capillaries merge to form venules and then the pulmonary veins, transporting the newly oxygenated blood to the left atrium of the heart where our journey started. A red blood cell's journey ultimately returns to the right atrium of the lung to be then reoxygenated by the lungs. The main structures that return blood to the heart are the brachiocephalic veins, the superior, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the pulmonary veins, which ultimately return oxygenated blood back to the heart from the lungs. Compared to systemic circulation, the vessels that make up the pulmonary circuit are relatively short. Blood doesn't need to be pumped as far during pulmonary circulation because the lungs are so close to the heart. In addition, the pulmonary arteries have less elastic connective tissue and wider lumens than systemic arteries, and as a result, blood pressure is lower in the pulmonary arteries than in the systemic arteries. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. For a bonus question, heart failure, an often terminal condition, can result from both a normal aging process as well as high blood pressure. What do you think happens to the walls of the ventricles leading up to a heart failure? Click to find out.